The basis to this equation is the land versus food. We know now that this is perhaps our planet, but our only planet. And every time we put in another human being on this globe, we actually decrease the amount of land available for uh, the growth of food for that individual. As we move to 2050, put that as a target, we expect three billion more people on this globe. Almost exclusively, as Janet hinted at, they will be in urban societies. Uh, the odd global financial crisis aside, they will be wealthier. And as they are wealthier, they will want to change their diets, include more animal protein in their diet. And animal protein is an expensive way to live. It might make you grow taller, as it's happening in the Asian societies now. But if you want to eat animal protein, it'll cost you somewhere between two and eight times what it does for plant protein. In other words, if you grow a chicken, it's twice, you grow a cow, eight times. So that's one pressure. The second pressure is this, uh, the love affair of modern societies with the automobile and the need for developed nations, so-called developed nations, to secure liquid fuels through the production of biofuels at the expense of food, using the same land that might have provided food to supply biofuels. Another pressure. So with that, we need at a minimum of 50% more food and probably 70 to 80% more food by 2050. That is the equation. Already the globe is responding. Uh, since Roman times, food security has been measured in days of grain in the granary. The Green Revolution took that problem in the 60s, leading to, in the 80s and the up to the 90s, a sufficiency of grain where we moved the amount of grain and the number of days of world supplies in the world's granaries from 50 to over 100 days. You'll notice after the 2000, there has been a decline and we are now back to 50 days from those pressures I just described to you. You'll also know there have been food riots around the world. That was perhaps a blip uh, in that, but 50 days is living on the edge. So where are we going to go and what resources do we have? I don't know what resources I have here. <laughs> there we go. Oh, somehow I lost something there. Oh, well, don't worry, these are just background. Uh, if you add up the demands for food in the way us agriculturalists do, for human food, for animal food, animal protein, and more latterly, biofuel, you get a number that tells you that you need, demand is increasing. It was increasing in the 70s by 1.5% per annum. In the 80s, it was 1.6. In the 90s, it was 1.9. Post-2000, because of the advent of mandated biofuel uh, targets, it is now 2.6, which means that we need to grow 2.6% more food with every year. And with the current projections we have, uh, we've got this target that we need to maintain productivity gains of 2 to 3 per cent until 2050, despite climate change. So what are the resources we have to do this with? It's not the case as it was in the agricultural revolution of the 19th century. It's not the case of the Green Revolution of the mid-century uh, of the 20th century. I think we're getting close to resource limits on this globe. Consider one of the key resource limits if you want to grow food, because for every kilogram of food you grow, you need about 
1,000 litres of water. Uh, so despite uh, someone telling us, Glenn Whitewig telling us we were very successful this morning at decreasing our water production in Melbourne down to 155 a day, Glenn, uh, as much as I love him, was not telling you the full amount. You actually need 6,000 litres because you've got to eat. And that's what it takes to feed someone on an Australian-American diet, five to 6,000 litres a day. So how, what shape are the world's great uh, irrigation areas, great production areas? The red across the slide behind you, you can see that many of the great food bowls of the world, North China Plain, India, Pakistan, some, some of the Middle East, not a great food bowl, but United States, southwestern United States, and of course our own Murray-Darling Basin are already water stressed. Last week I was in Beijing and we, with a joint seminar with the Chinese Academy of Sciences on water, they have a drought in the North China Plain. The North China Plain is fed by the Yellow River coming from the Tibetan Plateau, for those of you who this morning and heard of the decrease in the availability of water coming from the Tibetan Plateau. But the academician who talked to us left us with a view that China in the next 30 years would need another 100 million tonnes of grain. Uh, to give you an idea, in a good year, which we hope it is this year in Australia, we produce 30 million tonnes of grain. So that is another challenge. Come down to our own Mali Darling Basin, just to give you a bit of context, we could go to other catchments around the world and just look at what we're looking at. This is a projection of the inflows into the Murray River under a number of climate scenarios. But the blue line down the bottom represents the average inflow on the mark to the Murray over the last 13 years. This is a drought, we hope, in the last 13 years. But you can't help noticing, though, that where we're running in the current drought is effectively at a 2050 high climate change scenario. And that's what we were told that was happening this morning. We weren't told that that was happening in terms of rainfall, but that's our observation at present. So these are the things that we need to be prepared for. It won't necessarily be a slow decline in the temperature and rainfall that we got, increase in temperature, decrease in rainfall. In some sense, and this is the challenge from the University of Melbourne and Australia as a whole, uh, if it's going to happen anywhere, it's probably good. We are one of the worst nations, southern Australia, one of the worst hit areas in climate change. But we are a developed nation and we have one of the best developed R&D uh, systems in the world in agricultural context and also a way of getting that information to people who are actually farmers. So we can not only help ourselves in this, but we can play a leading role in the globe of determining the pathways forward for climate adaptation, but also the methodologies that you need to play, because as we mentioned this morning, it's not a top-down approach to climate adaptation. It's actually a bottom-up approach. You have to work with the people on the ground in order to do this, and Tim will do, talk more on this later. Oh, it's freaked out. Can we do it? We've seen water resources may be more limited than they were. Is there some productivity left in the science and left in our global grain stores. What I'm just briefly showing here that in that technology and science pathway in the United States, corn yields increased by essentially four times in the 50 years from 1950 to 2000. China got on that pathway uh, about 20 years after that and is now probably up to three times those yields. 
More recently, Latin America has got on that pathway and is probably up to twice those yields. Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, regrettably, is not on that pathway yet. So there is some pent-up productivity increases to be made on existing science that we have to be applied. What new science do we have? We have uh, great scientists have identified genes that can help us with these stresses that continually plague plant growth and crop growth, namely salinity stress, water stress and nitrogen stress because you need nitrogen to grow big crops. So we can identify these genes now and you will find that we have done an enormous amount at the time of the beginning of the Green Revolution, if you remember, as a scientist, you will know that we just really discovered DNA. Watson and Crick, 1956. Only, last, only in 2004 did we finally sequence the human gen genome. What will happen in the next decade, and some are almost, well, rice is pretty well there already, we will sequence all major, well, the major agricultural crops and the major agricultural animals. That doesn't mean we immediately, as it hasn't for human medicine, will unlock uh, enormous productivity increases, but it provides an enormous roadmap that modern plant breeding can utilise to meet these challenges. So there's a lot of new science since uh, 1960. What else is happening? Uh, the second thing which Len Whitequig mentioned this morning is information technology can play a large role in meeting this challenge in really three ways. The first is it's enormously valuable to manage risks in agriculture if you have good mid-season forecasts and you need to crunch a lot of data. So you, the advances in climate models and in mid-season forecasts, they haven't been realised yet, but we're hopeful we can do that and decrease a lot of the risks in that way. Secondly, as Len mentioned at all, the opportunity to manage in real time from electronic data that is collected around a farm and offers enormous possibilities to how you manage water more efficiently. And we think we can do that. And finally, probably the thing that's going to have the biggest impact, I think, and Tim might comment on this more, the world now has thrown away hard lines and uses mobile phones. The way of communicating both market information, technology, and increasing human capacity in a distributed way uh, offers enormous possibilities, and the, the humble mobile phone uh, offers that. Now, there is an urgency in this. I wanted to bring you back to Australia for a moment. Uh, the urgency is, and David Carolli indicated it this morning, in the interim, as CO2 increases up to a global warming in general terms of two degrees, CO2 can actually compensate for decreased rainfall. And the table I show you there, don't, I'm not going to go through it, but just look at the red bits. If you don't stabilise CO2 at less than 550, you end up in da dangerous climate change. And dangerous climate change for Australia, and this is Australia, this is around the Australian wheat belt, means that you get into the red because temperatures are just too high to adapt and rainfall is probably too low, and no matter how much CO2 you had, you couldn't do it. So you need, one, we need mitigation action internationally, but two, we need to harness our agricultural resources to use this window of opportunity. Yeah. Does investment help in this? We found out from the Green Revolution that investment in agricultural research yields very handsome gains. And we found out that 
If you invest wisely, there are strong returns to those investments. But the world was awash with grain by the time it got to 1990 and we stopped investing. And those yield increases tailed off and that's where they still are and Tim has more detailed data on that. So there is a strong case for investment in R&D in this. And we know that one, you get good, uh, good returns, but two, there are strong social returns. So if you invest in R&D in Australia, there will be spillover effects all around the world. So that globally, because of those social or spillover effects in economic terms, are found around the world through investment in one particular place. And finally, the solution to this is with Darwin. Darwin told us that... It wasn't the largest or the fastest or the most intelligent species that, that survived. It was actually the one that adapted fastest. And we are in an adaptive situation. We are in a situation where we not only have to adapt our food systems, but those food systems must adapt in the context of our energy systems and in our context of our water systems. So it's the adaption of the systems, not just the production of food. And to give you an indication of that, what we don't want to do, because agricultural greenhouse emissions globally are directly 15%, deforestation, which is largely for new agricultural land, is another 10%. And if you count the energy that is used in the production of food, it's probably about another 10%. So a third of the world's emissions come from agriculture. Somehow, in this systemic equation that we're looking at, we have to find a way to adapt and increase our food production, but not create a solution that leads to greater climate change through more greenhouse gas emissions. It's a challenging task. It's a task I hope the globe's up to, and bringing it back to the University of Melbourne, I think the University of Melbourne needs to play a large role in this. We have uh, enormous capacity and the nation in Australia, across other universities in Australia, other research institutions, have tremendous capacity to contribute to what might be global solutions that start with local solutions here. And finally, uh, to quote uh, Vice-Chancellor Glyn Davis, Lynn always says, a decision delayed is a decision made. We need to make a decision now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Snow. Also very uh, uh, thought-provoking and going to continue that theme of uh, uh, the, the arithmetic around global food security uh, and how... Uh, uh, um, food security can be achieved uh, in the 21st century. It's uh, now Professor Tim Reeves, the third and final speaker in our panel session. Professor Tim Reeves has worked for 40 years in agricultural research development and extension, focused on sustainable agriculture in Australia and overseas. His professional career includes positions in the Department of Agriculture, Victoria, Foundation Professor of Sustainable Agriculture, Agricultural Production at University of Adelaide from 1992 to 95 and more particularly the Director General of uh, the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Centre, CIMIT, uh, based in Mexico between 1995 and 2002. And, uh, of course, Snow mentioned the Green Revolution. This was the hotbed of it, sort of CIMIT. Uh, currently, aside from being a uh, professor at the University of Melbourne, he has his own consultancy firm, uh, which specialises in national and international, as we'll hear in a moment, consulting in agricultural R&D. Professor Tim Reeves. Thank you uh, very much, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as uh, Graham has said, I've had the privilege of working in many parts of the world. And I've seen that it's a world of great contrasts. 
You know, those of us who live most of our lives here in Australia, I think sometimes we forget just how fortunate we are. And also I've noted in my travels around the world that it's a world of contrast but also a world that is under enormous stress. Around 130 people are added to the population of the world per minute of every day. Not all those people are going to need cars. They're not all going to need flat-screen TVs. But they all have the expectation and the right of sufficient food and water and shelter to lead productive and worthwhile lives and to know the dignity of hard work. Unfortunately, the reality is rather different. That slide has 850 million people. 850 million people who go to bed each night hungry, who live in abject poverty. Unfortunately, I made that slide about 18 months ago. That figure is now over a billion. Part of that has been caused by the financial crisis that we've gone through. Over a billion people We've only got 6.8 on the planet living in abject poverty. Half the world's population lives on $2 or less per day. As I said to you, a world of great contrast indeed. And against that background, I think as, as citizens of the world, our highest priorities must be around food security and poverty alleviation. We look at food security, as Snow has eloquently outlined, there are a number of factors there. I mean, there are, there are short-term disruptions, and uh, the GFC there, even though these colours are blue and white, and some people that I know, uh, know that I barrack for Geelong Football Club, that GFC is actually the global financial crisis. <laughs> it's the, the worst of the two. It has had a tremendous impact, certainly on short-term investment in many things and of course in the, uh, the flow of money out of uh, resources including the so-called soft resources. But more particularly I want to draw your attention to the longer term impacts on food security because if we don't understand those we're not going to be able to move forward. And we have underestimated the longer term impacts on food security both on the demand side and the supply side. On the demand side the rapidly growing population, but also, particularly in Asia, growing um, incomes. More people with more money spend a lot more on food. Um, you've got twice the income, you don't just uh, spend twice as much on food, you might spend five or six times as much on food and want more and different kinds of food. So the demand side, we've underestimated it, but more particularly, We've underestimated the supply side. You know, the, if you uh, go to just about any country in the world, you know, there's a great belief that food comes from supermarkets. Well, it doesn't. It comes from farms. It comes from farms that are stressed by pests and diseases and increasingly by climatic extremes and the influences of the weather. And so we have really underestimated what it takes uh, to produce this supply of good, safe, and nutritious food uh, from planet Earth. Snow mentioned a number of factors on the supply side, and I just want to pick up one of them. And that we've got more people requiring more food, less land, and Perhaps most importantly, and, uh, and this has been referred to a couple of times already today, less water. The competition for water um, that is in finite supply, the degradation of some of those water supplies, the increasing demand for water in terms of urbanization, industrialization, um, for environmental purposes. About 
somewhere around 40 to 45 percent of global food production comes from irrigated systems. So anything that disrupts the supply of water for those food systems is going to have an enormous effect, not just on those directly living there, but on all of us in terms of global food security. On the demand side, as I said, the, the tremendous growth we've seen in income and consumption. Um, you can see it here in relation to Asia, 9% per annum in this period between 2000 and 4 and 6. But even in Africa, 6% increase. And you'll notice, of course, that the real growth is in the developing and emerging world uh, rather than in the industrialized countries where um, populations are stabilized, in some cases are declining, and their demands for food are not going up much. India, the projections by 2025, nearly a doubling of meat consumption, 70% um, increase, uh, sorry, more than, uh, yes, nearly a 176% increase in meat consumption, uh, about 70% increase in milk and vegetable consumption, and about a 30% increase in grain consumption. These are tremendous uh, challenges if you just looked at them by themselves. But once you combine the fact that we probably need to go somewhere between, I would say, between 50 and 100% more food with less land and less water and constrained by climate and constrained by energy, if that is not the most complex problem that the world faces up to, I'd hate to hear what it is. One can also say, in relation to this slide here, that if you're a, in uh, an Australian agricultural uh, producer, if you're a farmer in Australia, there are tremendous opportunities there. For the first time in the world, we've got the biggest markets, the biggest growing markets, more people with more incomes, right on our doorstep. 40 or 50 years ago, we used to have to send all our product around the world to, uh, to Europe. Um, uh, now, we have this huge extra demand for food on our doorstep, and one can see very much, well, and certainly in my vision, an Australasian, Australasian South American food bowl to feed basically the rest of the world in the Northern Hemisphere. So there are some real opportunities there as well um, in terms of the agricultural side. But let's go to, back to this whole question of the global situation. I've only got one busy slide, and this is it. So I'm not going to ask you to uh, look at too much, but this looks at the three most important food crops in the world, maize, wheat, and rice. And what it looks at is what is happening in terms of the increase in their yield around the world. Global food consumption, the demand increases by about 3 to 4% per year. So ideally, if your big food crops were increasing uh, their yield by 3 to 4% per year, at least you'd be holding your ground. But what has happened is that whilst in the sort of the, the 1967 to 96 period, um, for, for maize, for example, we were up around that 3%, 25 2.8%, etc., overall about 2.7%, overall about 2.2% for wheat, overall about 2% for rice... When we look at what's happened in the last period from 97 to 2006, most of these have halved or worse. And so our average yield growth rate per annum now, about 1.5% for maize, less than 1% for wheat, less than 1% for rice. The three most important food crops in the world, when food demand's going up by 3 to 4% per year, these are going the other way. Why? Snow has already mentioned it. One of the key hypotheses is a lack of investment in agriculture. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, uh, particularly in the industrialised world, um, there has been a disinvestment in agriculture um, significantly, particularly in those aspects of agriculture that are about productivity. 